Language is a key component of a unified people. It's supposedly representative of an ethnic oneness. Language exudes a cultural unity, a consolidation of people in heritage, communication, and in their collective memory. That is what we're told of the Jews of history, that they have been and are one people, the chosen people, with one identity, one eternally connected memory, and with a single central cause. But how can that be? How can the Jews be a unity of men, women, and children for over three millennia, yet not share one spoken language for at least the last two of those three millennia? That sounds more like a total lack of oneness and more of a divided group who carry the same faith, void of a unified culture and shared memory. Now, please don't get me wrong, this is not a critique of Jews in general, but more of a critique on the fundamental myth of the Zionist narrative, where the Jews of the world are one and have always been one. A unified group of people of ethnicity, race, culture, and tradition, and have been one since their history began, and to this day. As per Zionists, this oneness continues. And if you believe the Zionists, that Hebrew in its current form progressed over the ages into what it is today, then you've been hoodwinked. Again, this story ultimately has nothing to do with the Jews around the world, as they represent more or less the reality of Jews, people of a certain Abrahamic faith that are part or identify with a particular nation-state, be it England, France, or the United States, who speak English or French, but whom, when wanting to practice their faith, recite their prayers and traditions within the old Hebrew language, much in the same way Pakistani Muslims practice their Muslim faith in Arabic. But when it comes time for day-to-day -day living, they speak Urdu. But one major difference in this comparison is that Arabic has always been a living language for both the religion and the people, whereas Hebrew, uh, not so much. Hebrew was virtually dead. So okay, Jews across the world practice their faith in Old Hebrew yet live daily within the confines of their mother tongues. So what's the problem? Why make a video about this topic? Well. This story, as I mentioned earlier, is part of a larger Zionist narrative, that the Hebrew language has always been an integral element in the unity of the Jewish people, not only in the way it was far away into antiquity, but actually how it is today, as if nothing has significantly changed. The Zionist selling point of the oneness of the Jewish people was a fundamental aspect in establishing the sympathies of the world, and in parallel, in romanticizing the cause. And the cause was that one people, the chosen people, needed a safe home and refuge. Therefore, the Zionist legend of a living, unifying Hebrew spoken language of the Jews had to be made real. But when we delve into the history of the Hebrew language as we know it, a different story is told, and one that disputes the Zionist version of reality. In researching the progression of the language, one moment in time defines its transition from Old Hebrew to that of modern Hebrew as it is known and spoken today. And that moment in time was around when the mass migrations of the Jews from around the world and namely Eastern Europe took place. The immigration of the Jews into Palestine, referred to as First Aliyah at the end of the 19th century and Second Aliyah over the first 15 years of the 20th century, brought together a large contingent of Jews into the Middle Eastern territories. For centuries, Jews in such numbers didn't exist in these Arab lands. Upon its establishment, the Zionist World Organization sponsored and organized these mass immigrations without any real regard for consequences. Such an unnatural bringing together of many peoples created all sorts of havoc on the lands. A major byproduct was a situation where many different ethnic groups with different nationalities and tongues were brought to Palestine without being able to communicate with each other or the indigenous peoples. What was clearly self-evident was that there was not one common language amongst its supposed one people. Being Jews, Hebrew as they knew it was strictly a language of religious practices and not one for common day-to-day -day interaction. It lacked the vocabulary. It lacked the concepts and structures of modern-day communication and living. It lacked the familiarity with the progression of human development over the many millennia, be it from social or behavioral perspectives. Hebrew had no concept of modern technology and the speed in which things were changing during the 20th century. To fix this awkward moment, something had to happen. Change necessary in bringing together this divided people was crucially needed. 
language needed to adapt, and the language needed to be adopted. The Zionist narrative will have you believe that Old Hebrew and its jump into Modern Hebrew followed a natural evolution and growth, that it was a revival of the Old Hebrew language. But the contrary is true. They say that one person cannot invent a language, yet for the Zionists, one man was able to. Enter Eliezer Perlman. And in his case, he pretty much did invent Modern Hebrew. Perlman would go on to change his name as would most Jews that moved to the Palestinian territories from Eliezer Perlman to Eliezer bin Yehuda. He was educated in Old Hebrew, whereas his mother tongue was Yiddish, a West Germanic language common with most Eastern European Jews. Bin Yehuda, an immigrant from the Russian Empire, recognized the situation of Jews in their newly colonized lands. There was no unified language of the Jewish people. Yiddish and its other dialects were intermixed with Latin-based languages plus other Semitic languages like Arabic. It was like the story of the Tower of Babel all over again, a sinful people having to deal with each other, but with no real means of communication. And one fact to shed light on, Bin Yehuda's thoughts on the Hebrew language had always been heavily Zionist. He would go on to state it simply. Hebrew and Zionism were symbiotic. Hebrew for him was above all other languages, even ancient languages like Aramaic and Arabic. Bin Yehuda independently began with attempts to restructure a new language that was based on Old Hebrew, but would experience significant pushback from fellow immigrants. But his efforts would not go unnoticed and would catch the attention of the Zionist leadership and would result in Bin Yehuda's major involvement in establishing the Committee for the Hebrew Language that was mandated to create a new and modern language for the Jewish people in Palestine. And thus began the efforts to piece together a modern Hebrew language, and as per the renowned Israeli scholar of Arabic language, Joshua Blau, Ben Yehuda would go on to insist. In order to supplement the deficiencies of the Hebrew language, the committee coins words according to the rules of grammar and linguistic analogy from Semitic roots, Aramaic, Canaanite, Egyptian, and especially from Arabic roots. Bin Yehuda wouldn't stop there. He'd go on to openly introduce substantial Arabic words, not because he found it more convenient due to their practicality and use within the localized context, but because he believed that Arabic had considerably taken its root structure system and form from Hebrew itself. He would state, the roots of Arabic were once a part of the Hebrew language, lost to us, and now we have found them again. And with this mindset, we're introduced hundreds if not thousands of Arabic and Aramaic words into modern Hebrew. These introductions were termed a borrowed vocabulary that would include all types of nouns, adjectives, and phrases. The eye-opening observation was that many of the words that were borrowed from Arabic were totally necessary for an existence in the lands of Palestine. Words that explain the local weather, the local habitat and flora, words denoting the local raw foods. For me, this would introduce a question. How could a language that was so ancient and belonging to these lands like Hebrew be so void of and having so little to say and explain about the local landscape of the promised land? It wasn't only nouns and names that would be introduced, but word constructs that were specifically Arab for greetings and interjections. There were no limits to the borrowing that took place and that would continue beyond Bin Yehuda's time, and up until the early to mid 20th century, when the Zionist movement was at its most active in selling its story to the world, to garner as much sympathy as it now had its oneness, its collective Hebrew language. The new and modern Hebrew language would not only unify the communication of a people, more importantly, its words served the Zionist mission and became the tenet of Zionist ideology. It really didn't matter that a significant part of this new language was borrowed from the same people Zionists claimed never existed, the Palestinians. This new language would engrave concepts of struggle, suffering, homecoming, and belonging into the local Jewish psyche, concepts that had never really existed prior to the 20th century. Nonetheless, these concepts would be expressed as ancient states of being for the Jewish people. 
It's common for one culture to borrow from another. That is what every culture has done in history at a certain period of time. And that's not my contention. What Zionists practice is. The notion that the gap in the use of the Hebrew language for the Jews was never real. That they always had a language that connected them. And that any borrowed words were indeed always there and belonged to the Jews and their Hebrew language. The truth of the matter is that there are no other examples of a natural language without any native speakers subsequently acquiring several million native speakers, and no other examples of a sacred language becoming a national language with millions of native speakers in such a short period of time. As I said at the outset, it's unnatural. And to respond further to the Zionist narrative, when reviewing more recent Israeli studies on modern Hebrew, Many will diminish the reality of the borrowing or integration of Arabic or Aramaic into the language. They'll say if it was done, then it was nominal, and that most borrowed words happened centuries ago. I personally doubt that. Why not just come out and admit the fact? Admit that when you borrowed, you borrowed. Because when you don't admit it, then the borrowing transforms into stealing. But that, I guess, is the Zionist way. Never admit to any wrongdoing.